Hello, Renu. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, Declan. Ni hao. I'm afraid I'll, I need to expand my knowledge of Mandarin and Cantonese, I think. I think for the next episode, we have to learn a bit more. Okay, you're all very welcome to this episode <laughs> of GU Cast. This is the second of our special themed episodes focusing on uh, prostate cancer in China, uh, supported by our gold partners, Bayer in China. Um, so as regular listeners will know, we have quite a big mixed global audience, but we have a very good audience that is growing in China. And we're very interested to learn from our Chinese colleagues all about GU Oncology. So thank you to Bayer in China. We are now able to make GU Cast available on the local hosting platforms in China so we can reach a, a bigger audience there. So the first episode was very popular. It was, it was. And it was very nice because our, our GU Cast China editor, uh, Professor Yao Zhu, was actually here in the studio with us. That so was a very special time for, for, for both parties. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Yao is our China editor and he'll be joining us in a moment uh, from Shanghai. He's a urologist at Fudan University Shanghai Cancer Center and he helps us put together these China-themed uh, podcasts. And we're going to talk about radical prostatectomy today. We are. So it's a... It's a, a I think it's a great topic, you know, especially with the recent changes in the EAU guidelines. Um, and it's, you know, China is very advanced uh, in their robotic platforms. And I think we can learn a lot from, from what they're doing. Exactly. So there's three things coming up in the podcast. We'll be getting through, first of all, what's going on with pelvic lymph node dissection with our colleagues in China, especially after the EAU guidelines changed this year. And we had a really good discussion about that on a recent episode. Uh, number two, what are the surgical approaches preferred in China? Is open surgery still being performed? What about classic laparoscopic surgery? Uh, and finally, thirdly, what about robot surgery? Because mm. uh, as many of you robot users out there know, uh, there is a wave of new technology coming out of China that most of us really have no experience with yet. Uh, but some of our guests tonight uh, will be able to talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. But first, I think, Declan, we should uh, talk a little bit about Bayer, China, because yes. um, they've been um, specifically our uh, conference highlight sponsors. That's right. Um, and and it's, been w it's been a wonderful collaboration. You know, we, we've, I think conference highlights have always been very popular for the people that attend and also for the people that don't get a chance to attend and see what, you know, what the, what the latest data is. Um, we, you know, we interview some, some superstars in the field um, and we released, you know, the USENSE highlights this year and the two parts of the APCCC highlights. Um, and it's been, I think it's been a very successful venture. Yes, and thanks to Bayer in China for not just being gold partners for these uh, China episodes, but for supporting those conference highlights. Um, and we had Professor Ding Wai Ye Professor Ye, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, at APCCC, a, a dedicated interview with him, which which is very good. Very good. Thanks for that. And, and finally, before we get into it, um, there was breaking news uh, today. I saw that, um, and we'll talk about this in a future episode, but there's a trial that we've talked about on the podcast that we've all been waiting to see the results of, which is the Aranote study. Uh, and there was a press release about the Aranote study today uh, telling us that it's met its endpoint, positive endpoint. So That's right. Aranote, which is the doublet of darolutamide and ADT in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So they've reached their primary endpoint of OS. Wow. So there you go. Big Yet news. They are celebrating. More good news from metastatic <laughs> hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And we'll, be, we'll be hearing more about that at ESMO, I think. But yeah. Um, Anyway, there you go. Let's get into it. Radical prostatectomy. Let's talk about Goodness. surgery, Renu. So shall we uh, go to our friends in China? Let's switch over uh, and see, can we join uh, Professor Zhu and colleagues? Um, uh, Yao Zhu, uh, joining us first of all from Shanghai. Welcome. Thank you for coming back to GU Cast. Good to see you, Zhu. Really glad to be back and uh, really nice to have several Chinese experts, friends uh, in the GU Cast studio and uh, really great to, uh, to be back to the interesting discussing as we, always. We miss you here in the studio. It was wonderful yeah. to have you with us in person. You must come back. Your seat is right here. That's empty right. though. <laughs> but it's very yes, good of you to great. Very good of you to join us. And thank you very much for lining up two distinguished guests uh, to join us to talk about radical prostatectomy today. Uh, we have uh, your colleagues uh, from Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, first of all, Professor Jihua Pan from Renji Hospital, affiliated to Shanghai Jai Tong Hospital uh, in Shanghai. Uh, Professor Pan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and also Professor Ming Lu, uh, Director and Chief Physician of Urology at the Beijing Hospital in Beijing. Uh, Professor Liu, thank you very much for joining us as well. Thank you. 
Great. And look, um, uh, let's get right into it, Renu. Um, uh, as we talked about earlier, the, the EAU guidelines um, influence practice all around the world, certainly here in Australia, where they are the official guidelines of our society. But I know from previous travel to Shanghai that the EAU guidelines are uh, looked at very, very much uh, by our Chinese colleagues as well. Absolutely. Um, and there were, you know, so they come out, they get updated in March every year. And this year, there were a few changes that directly affect radical prostatectomy practice. And we want to chat about the, the first of those which is about pelvic lymph node dissection. That's right. So, I mean, I think the, the EAU guidelines are always worded very cleverly. So they've divided uh, the new recommendations into two groups, the intermediate risk and high risk. And in intermediate, the pelvic lymph node dissection is completely dropped. Yeah, There's no amazing. mention of doing a pelvic lymph node dissection. And in the high risk disease, the, the guidelines suggest that if you do a pelvic lymph node dissection, then the recommendation is that you do an extended pelvic lymph node dissection. That is if you make the decision to do it. So you don't have to do it, but if you do do it, do, a, do an extended pelvic node dissection. So that strong recommendation for doing a lymph node drops. dissection is gone. So what do we think about that uh, in China? Uh, let's go and chat uh, to you, first of all, uh, Professor uh, Liu Ming. Um, uh, what is your view on uh, the role of pelvic lymph node dissection at the time of radical prostatectomy? Yeah, actually, um, uh, just as you know, uh, you have mentioned, the EU guideline affect our clinical practice very much. I can remember about seven or eight years ago when at very beginning EU guideline recommend uh, pelvic lymph node dissection for the intermediate or high risk prostate cancer to do the extended lymph node dissection. We in our hospital we perform the strictly for. Uh, follow the the EAU guideline, but after uh, more than 100 cases, we find that, that if the MRI uh, before the operation is negative, the result, I mean, the, the, the positive lymph node rate is extremely low, less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So this those kind of patient, it means more than eight, uh, uh, 90% of the patients, the pelvic lymph node dissection does not help them. Uh, so um, we uh, do not routinely do the pelvic lymph node dissection for intermediate risk risk patient. For high risk patient, we do do the lymph node dissection. But when we perform, you know, extended lymph node dissection, uh, that means inter internal iliac area uh, uh, up to uh, uh, up to rater nerve area and external. Uh, some patients just have, you know, a very severe edema of the lower limb mm -hmm. and yeah. the scrotum. It's, it's very bad. You have no 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 way to treat them. Uh, the patient does not happy about it uh, about yeah. it. And even we 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 just do the the lymph node dissection for the high risk patient. The positive lymph node rate is still very low. Yeah. And now we have PSMA PET. So the question is for those with negative MRI, negative PSMA PET for the lymph node, do we still need uh, extended lymph node dissection? Uh, actually, in our clinical practice, I tend to do internal iliac and up to retail nerve and uh, leave the external. Because I find in that case, uh, the lower limb edema and scrotum edema is very, uh, the rate is very low. The patients are very happy. And uh, the, you know, if the, 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 the MRI or even PET is negative, it's very rare for patients to have external iliac lymph node positive. So that's my mm. opinion. Thank you. I really like that. Wow. So, um, and I totally agree with you. I think it's as you go laterally, that's where you, you increase the risk of morbidity. Um, uh, and I'm very interested in how you uh, are now using the novel imaging to help inform the decision. Um, Professor Pan, um, uh, do you have a similar approach to pelvic lymph node dissection, um, especially, I suppose, with the increasing availability I know of PSMA PET in China? Yeah, actually, like this, uh, because, you know, in uh, some big city like Beijing and Shanghai, the PSMA PET CT scan is more and more popular. And as the demographic data of prostate cancer is totally different from the from China to Western country or Australia, we have uh, about 30% of the cases are local advanced disease and about 30% of the cases are metastatic disease. And uh, 
other about 40%, they are localized. So I think with the PSMA PET CT scan, it is a little bit different from the background of the EAU guideline. Uh, that is to say, if we do a PSMA PET CT scan, if there is no M1A disease or there is no uh, metastatic disease, uh, if there is uh, with or without uh, lymph node involvement in the pelvis area, if we do uh, the pelvis uh, APRND in high risk case, we have the possibility to cure him. So that is the uh, my logic for to for the treatment for this this kind of disease. If the patient have a high risk cancer, I do PSMA. If PSMA negative or positive in the pelvic area, uh, if the, the patient have no metastasis, I will treat him uh, uh, like with a EPRND. So I think uh, maybe after several years we will have some uh, newly published data. Uh, with, we're sure that maybe uh, can help the oncologic outcome. Because several years ago, there was a, a paper published in uh, European Urology. Uh, it says that if the patient, uh, we do have EPRND, uh, we harvest eight lymph node, 12 lymph node, 20 lymph node, and 45 lymph node, the, uh, clean, uh, the oncologic outcome is totally different. There is a static uh, difference in the data. So I think maybe it is also helpful. That is why the EU guideline showed that uh, says that uh, if you do a PRND, just to do a enlarged. Yeah, mm, that's my opinion. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's still very contentious, isn't it? And um, so I, our, my view, I think Renew's view as well, is that uh, we have been doing too many pelvic lymph node dissections over the years and the, the guidelines were always very strongly promoting the uh, the nomograms as a way of predicting it but the problem is you know the nomogram might predict 10 percent likelihood of lymph node involvement and then it says do an extended node dissection but that means there's a 90 percent chance that these patients have a yeah useless uh, lymph node dissection and might get leg edema and so on so I think it is good that we um, uh, have moved away from that position, but I still think many people, um, many of our friends in Europe still uh, are a bit unhappy with the uh, de-emphasis with the lymph node dissection going down. And I think we expect to see some articles coming in the, in the magazines in European urology uh, to say, hold on, hold on, you know, we should not just abandon pelvic lymph node dissection what do you think yeah i mean i i think uh, you know at the the rate of finding a positive lymph node is low but then the rate of that having an oncological benefit yeah. is even lower yeah. um and i think that's been the philosophy for us in australia that have sort of you know driven us away from doing um pelvic lymph node dissection and then psma pet i think was really the final nail in the coffin for it here yeah. in in australia um but um professor Zhu, i'm interested i mean it, you know at the fudan cancer yeah. center you have embraced new generation imaging i mean both decades and I've been to the wonderful preceptorships that you've you've held there. How has um, the arrival and the use of PSMA PET changed the way you manage, you know, whether or not you do a lymph node dissection? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I think I'm a great fan of PSMA. So my practice may be uh, based mainly on the PSMA staging of high-risk patients. And I think uh, the reluctance to perform a lymph node dissection in prostate cancer, uh, mainly because there is no strong oncological benefit in patients treated with prophylaxic uh, lymph node dissection. And we can see the increase in morbidity and uh, the post-operative complication, especially the DVT or embolism is quite high in patients underwent external uh, extended lymph node dissection. And I think this is the main reason to uh, lower the recommendation to perform lymph node dissection in the EU guidelines. And uh, the second point, I think, uh, in the PSMA area, especially the pro-PSMA trial, advocate the PSMA staging in patients with high-risk features, is we face a different risk-benefit ratio for intermediate and high-risk patients. For example, with the conventional imaging, we rely on the lymph node dissection to detect or accurate staging patients. Mm. So we may have one patient with lymph node metastasis after five lymph node dissection. 
Mm. However, with PSMA imaging, although we can not detect all the metastases, we can uh, lower the risk and uh, increase the risk and benefit ratio. Like we have to perform uh, 10 or 20 lymph node dissection to detect one patient with a very small lymph node metastasis. And we also do not know whether the small lymph node metastasis will impact the patient's long-term yeah. outcome. So this is a very important point. And uh, our surgeon, very unfortunate, still do not have very strong level three evidence to prove this. So I'm looking forward to the colleagues from the Germany or other big institutions to confirm that uh, extended lymph node dissection is uh, outweighed the no lymph node dissection in these patients. But uh, before this evidence coming out, I still highly rely on the PSMA. And uh, for patients without uh, uh, PSMA average disease, I will discuss with the patient and recommend no lymph node dissection and only remove the primary tumor. So this is my practice. Yeah, it's really, I mean, he said it so well, didn't he? Because, uh, we, you know, in the in the era of conventional imaging, we needed something to better stage these patients. Mm -hmm. and, and the lymph node dissection had that role. But, you know, PSMA PET scan has really taken over that, that role of surgery. And, and before we move on to talk about surgery and types of surgery, um, Professor Ye, when he was speaking at the APCCC in Lugano, was showing some data on the changing um, uh, demographic of uh, prostate cancer in China and showing a huge increase in the number of radical prostatectomies being done in mm -hmm. Fudan University, Shanghai. And I'm sure it's the same in, in Renji uh, Hospital and in Beijing Hospital. Um, you are performing more surgery. You are seeing more prostate cancer that is uh, suitable for surgery. So this is an um, important discussion, I think. Absolutely. Um, so, Renu, shall good. we go and talk about surgery? Yes, absolutely. Types you know, we've got three great surgeons on board. Let's let's see what they do. Yeah. So, look, our question first of all, before we talk about the robot um, uh, platforms, is to ask uh, what is the role of open surgery and uh, classic laparoscopic surgery? Uh, so, Professor Ming Lu, uh, can you give us um, uh, the view on these different surgery approaches uh, in Beijing, for example? Uh, in Beijing, uh, for most of the big hospitals, uh, they usually perform the robot. Uh, only few hospitals that do not have a robot, they do a traditional laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. For the open surgery, I think maybe less than 1%. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe zero. That's the situation in, in Beijing. Wow. And, and what about in the regions, in the countryside, uh, outside Beijing? Um, I presume, well, like here in Australia, that the robots are only in the bigger centers. Uh, what about in, in the regions in China, in the countryside? Uh, I think till now, uh, um, the robot only uh, can find in the big cities, big hospitals. But I believe in the maybe... In five years, uh, because the Chinese robot become more and more common, mm -hmm. I think more and more uh, countryside hospital, they have Chinese robot. And uh, I believe many of them can perform the radical prostatectomy themselves. Yeah. So this <laughs> is that is the trend. This is very exciting uh, for us to hear more about these uh, Chinese robots, uh, Professor Pan. Um, so... Over the past year, uh, actually, first of all, here in Melbourne last year um, uh, at the, the uh, World Robotics Symposium, we saw for the first time some of these Chinese robots in the exhibition area. And since that time, we have seen some examples of um, tele-surgery, uh, remote surgery, uh, with uh, Dr. Vip Patel in Florida performing some surgery on uh, animals and on patients um, far away. Uh, but I do not think we yet are seeing these Chinese platforms uh, in clinical hospitals outside China. So can you tell us, uh, have you any experience um, of these uh, new systems uh, in China or what's happening? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Actually, we have uh, uh, started the, the new robot system in China. I think that was in 2021. 
Um, at that time, I, in our institution, we have already two different robots. And the, uh, the, the first robot I tried was MedBot, which is uh, uh, produced by Shanghai Michael Pot uh, Company. Uh, at, at that time, it was the clinical trial. It was a uh, phase three clinical trial in Shanghai, in multi institution, uh, two institutions in Shanghai, uh, three in Shanghai, one in uh, Zhejiang. Uh, actually, for the first generation robot, uh, there is a large difference, large discrepancy from the Da Vinci robot and uh, the Chinese robot. It, it is, it is, uh, it is difficult to manipulate. Actually, if you Think the French robot at that time was a Mercedes. The Chinese robot is that <laughs> actually, but now it's totally <laughs> different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can do a at that time. I did the first uh, medbot uh, surgery um, in our institution. I normally I finish a robot robotic uh, radical prostatectomy around one hour, and at that time for the first first case I I performed about three hour and a half or maybe four hours. So it is uh, uh, difficult, but the Chinese robots develop very quickly. Okay. You know the, the engineer and the 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 the, sub, the teams were robotic t uh, engineering teams was all around us. And after one surgery, they will, they will note all the records and and the, ask the doctor's opinions and just a change in the night. And the second wow. day, we restarted the robot and uh, we do another surgery. Uh, we can feel a little bit changes. So step by step, now uh, the for example, the medbot had uh, the uh, third generation uh, robot. The the difference between the Defensive robot and the, the medbot is very close. So uh, we can see uh, that uh, the the surgical view and the, the, the intuitive move movement is almost the the same. Wow. And also we have other, and we have other other brands in Chinese market. You know, another another one is called Kanto. It is it is a combination maybe the Zeus and the intuitive system. You know, it, it have a three arm system, and you know there is some remote area in China, and they can maybe afford the the the. The, the the defense system and even cannot afford the medbot the four arm wow. system they can the third arm uh, to do some uh, to do some easy surgery or maybe to put one or two assistant port to 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 just uh, do the do the same surgery and if the the hospital has more money they can buy this fourth arm and put it together ah, to just upgrade. like the fourth arm okay. the system and if they have more money. They can they can have changed it. They, the, the the factory and the robotic company can take back the the three arm system and the one arm, and they give them a four arm system. You know, <laughs> they can do an company. upgrade. Yeah, so, right. Also, the third generation will come. That it, uh, they they can put uh, five arms, and uh, uh, a system can manipulate two arms, and uh, the five main arms. surgeon can, uh, yeah, five arms. Uh, three, uh, three, uh, uh, four arms, one, uh, one console, and another arm can be controlled by the uh -huh. assistant. So this is another system, and also there is some four arm system, and also another one. I should emphasize is the single port. You know, Da Vinci has the single port SP system, and the Chinese has a Shuray system. It is uh, totally different from this, uh, the sing, uh, the the SP Da Vinci. And, but it can do the single port system. But uh, for the moment, it has uh, some difference. As, uh, uh, between the Defense and the, the SP and uh, the Shure system, and uh, also there's there are some discrepancy between the two systems, and uh, but I think after two to four uh, three years, maybe the Shure system can uh, follow up the Defense SP system and can uh, go to the market. So I think uh, the Chinese robot has a very um, a good future. Wow. <laughs> We're both sitting here with our uh, that, mouths open going, I, wow. I, I know, but it's coming so quickly. And yeah. that description, Professor Pangame, of how quickly they're, they're evolving. They've adapted, yes, and absolutely. They, you know, but that's the history of Chinese technology and yeah. manufacture. It's going jumping so fast now. Yeah. Um, and it's making a big difference, I think, to affordability in China. That's part of the message I just heard. Um, that the, these um, three arm robots uh, will be more widely available now, and then you can upgrade and you can upgrade. And Professor Pan, did I hear you correctly? Did you mention the Zeus uh, system? 
Uh, yeah. So I, I wonder, I, I'm, I'm having a memory from 20 years ago. I, I remember yeah. the uh, Zeus system from computer motion, but you're too young, probably. I don't think I remember you that. See? <laughs> um, but, you know, there will be old people like me who go, the Zeus, I remember the Zeus system before Intuitive bought it over and, and you know, squashed it because it was the only competition. <laughs> so Professor Pan has a long memory and uh, I loved hearing that story. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and Professor Liu, what about training uh, on the ro- on these oh, yeah. new robot platforms? Um, you know, do the do the companies uh, offer some kind of training environment uh, for either surgeons wanting to move to the new system from Intuitive, or for your trainees and residents and fellows who are who are going through uh, their urology training? How, what's training like? Yeah, actually, this uh, Chinese company they just follow the protocol of the. Da Vinci, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the training program, they have their own training center and uh, quite similar training program as Da Vinci. And uh, for the, 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 the buyer, the new, new surgeon of the Chinese robot. And I think uh, when we mention about the remote surgery, uh, I think, uh, uh, actually, I don't think remote surgery will, 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 will be, you know, quite popular in the world. But one thing is remote teaching. Mm. If, uh, you know, when uh, a, a small hospital, they at first time they have uh, a Chinese robot system, they uh, start to do their own surgery. And if there is a, a very, you know, um, there's an expert from remote can guide him how to do the surgery. And in some, you know, in some situation, if they cannot perform the surgery, uh, you know, the expert can take the control and um, and help them to, to, to finish it. I mm-hmm. think it is easier for them to, to start the operation and it's safer for the patient. So yeah. I think the, the remote surgery uh, actually, uh, we in our hospital we have already performed the the the, the animal experiment, and uh, it's uh, about to start a, a, a human trial. Uh, I think this kind of uh, um, you know uh, trial can help us to build a remote teaching system or supervi- supervi- supervising system. Mm. So that's a better way you know, to do the, the robot training, I think. Yeah. Especially in a huge country like China, but we can imagine this in a huge country like Australia with a lot of geographic challenges. The idea of tele-mentoring and tele-supervision yeah. is attractive. And what we have been seeing with some of these reports of tele-surgery from China is extremely short uh, latency between the, the cities and very good reliability um, I've seen reports of um, fiber optic networks, but even of like 5G or 6G or whatever you have in China being good enough to, to do this type of critical surgery. So, and this is something we're only seeing from these new Chinese systems. So very, very exciting. Uh, um, uh, Zhu, let's, let's go to you for the final uh, uh, opinion about the new Chinese robots and also of telesurgery. Um, because, of course, those of us out here in the West, we don't see these systems coming out of China yet. Um, so you have to help us understand how quickly it's changing and um, and uh, your experience. Yes. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Declan. So I have uh, visited your institute several times and then I see the robotic machine and the training center uh, in your institution. And uh, I also... Uh, have uh, experience to develop a new Chinese machine uh, led by Professor Ye, and uh, we have developed uh, a modular robotic machine to uh, performing surgery. And I think there is a two stage for the Chinese company or the Chinese surgeons. They want to make a difference in this area. The first stage is we also ask the question, whether there is difference between the new machine and the Da Vinci robotic machine. So we're trying to stimulate the maneuver or the action of the Da Vinci machine. And I think it's achieved like uh, uh, one or two years ago. But nowadays, many Chinese surgeons and the companies, they ask us the, another question. Can we make some difference compared to the Da Vinci machine? 
and I totally agree with Professor Pan and Professor Liu. Uh, the advantage to develop a new machine is that in the develop or the design phase, our surgeon and the company, we have very close relationship. And we may even discuss every day hmm. or every week to how to improve our uh, new robotic, whether it combined with the 5G uh, network to improve the telesurgery uh, access or whether we combine with uh, a cost effective goal to reduce the cost of the very big diffusion machine, or can we incorporate the AI, um, the deep learning of the imaging to facilitate the training and the warning sign during the new surgeon's uh, training process? Because uh, in your institute, we can see there are two diffusion console and uh, you always create the different uh, difficult uh, case uh, of the internship or the resident so can we using another ai machine which can uh, have this similar role in the training and it will greatly improve the uh, spread of the robotic surgery so i think in this stage many chinese companies and many chinese surgeons are trying to make a difference compared to the da Vinci machine because it's uh, it's always lead the area, but it's always confined by the current uh, uh, design or current perspective from this company. And whether if we can just jump out uh, the comfort zone, maybe we can make some very interesting and different uh, uh, new machine. So this is my perspective. Declan, is... you never know. They may be the first to put a robot in space. A robot in space, exactly. Absolutely. Telesurgery. Telesurgery at its finest. Well, look, that was a, just a fantastic discussion. I love really this was. last section about the robots, the new robots coming. And um, you get the impression if we talk about it in one year's time, it'll have jumped it'll even further. It'll be vastly different, yes. And, absolutely. and maybe we'll get some experience outside China. But it, yeah. it, otherwise, we're coming to visit. I want to come and watch some of these uh, absolutely. systems. Absolutely. Um, which we might actually do later this year, actually uh, go and visit our friends in China and record GU Cast up there. We have a, yeah. a, a plan mm. to go and do that um, uh, in Shanghai later this year. We that will come, wonderful. And, come and visit. Yeah. But look, that's all we have time for, I think. Yeah, um, what, a, what a great 30 minutes it's been. Yeah, so look. Learning from these uh, fantastic surgeons in China. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Zhu, our China editor, for putting together this episode. And a special thanks to Professor uh, Ming Lu and Professor Zhu Hao Pan for joining us to talk about these topics. We really learned from you today and we appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. That's great. Well, that's all we have time for on this episode of GU Cast, one of our special Bayer China themed podcasts. And we were really thrilled to bring this one today, Renu. I think it meant, it meant a lot to us. Um, and we'll be back again um, with a special China themed episode in a couple of months' time. Um, um, but of course, uh, we'll be back in the next couple of weeks with more great GU Cast coming at you. Absolutely. Until then. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. good night. Good night.